Welcome back to Wishwell Farms, everybody. Today we are bringing in the coconut core slabs into our grape tomato greenhouse. We're gonna be lining them all up in here in preparation for planting, transplanting grape tomatoes, hopefully tomorrow. I'm actually ready to do it today, but before we can, we have to put the irrigation lines into these slabs so they uh, get rehydrated. They are compressed and dry. You can see that they're only about a half inch thick. And when they're fully saturated, they'll be about, oh, probably four inches. You know, they'll, they'll fill up the bag completely. They'll swell right up overnight with uh, multiple uh, irrigation cycles with the irrigation system. So as soon as we get these things laid out and hydrated, we'll be ready to bring the great tomatoes in here, hopefully tomorrow afternoon. So if you're wondering why all the irrigation lines and drippers are hanging upside down, it's because at the end of the season, it makes it a lot easier to rip all the old bags and plants out the back door without getting tangled up in these. So we uh, just zip time to the T-post, drag everything out, sweep everything up, and it makes it a lot easier. So as soon as we get all these bags laid out, We'll drop these irrigation lines back on top of them so we can put the stakes, these little dripper stakes, down into the coconut core to get them rehydrated. We're fortunate this year to have three holes pre-cut into each bag. I think in the past three seasons, I have not had pre-cut holes. We've had to like cut a little X and make our own hole on top. So this is really nice to have these pre-cut holes in these slabs. Makes our job a lot easier when it comes to placing the rock wool cubes of grape tomatoes right where they belong. I'm sure I'm gonna get the question, why do I use coconut core bags in here versus the Dutch Beto buckets and perlite? Several reasons. Um, in my first two greenhouses, greenhouse number one and two, the tall house and the long house, both of those Dutch Beto bucket systems and irrigation lines, the drip tubes, that all came with the greenhouse when I bought them. They were used and all I had to do was break them down, stack them and bring them back to the farm. Now in my small greenhouse, greenhouse number three, we call it our little house because it's the smallest one, it's 21 by 96. I did purchase new Beto buckets for that greenhouse and had to drill the holes in all the drain tubes and it was a big pain in the butt and Beto buckets and perlite are not cheap. The coconut core bags are far cheaper, but there's a drawback. It's much harder to keep a close eye on the leachate, monitor, monitoring the leach. So any leach or drainage from these bags is just leaking out of the bags because I'll put slits in them and it just drains through the ground cover into the soil. But because these are grape tomatoes, they're in my mind far more forgiving than like a red round beefsteak tomato. Those have to be precisely monitored for what they're being fed, how many ounces of leachate are coming out of the buckets so you can figure out if you need to adjust the EC on a daily basis, depending on the clouds and the sun and the stage of growth of the plant. These grape tomatoes are kind of at the mercy of what the big greenhouses with the red round tomatoes, beefsteak tomatoes, are getting fed. I don't have a way to adjust it specifically for grape tomatoes. And for that reason, and it being cheaper to use coconut core, we've decided just to go that route in here. I never really pay attention to the leach. The only thing I really look at is are the bags dry? Are they fully saturated? And maybe a little bit of overflow on the little slits I make at the bottom of the bag. So that's the main thing I'm concerned about. And they always do fantastic for us. We do have some issues with them splitting later in the season. And when that starts happening, like mid to late July, we just call it quits and pull them out. They would keep on producing just fine. But when you start having splits everywhere, it's just not worth the, the hassle of pulling all those out and leaving the split ones behind or sweeping them up off the floor, you know, because sometimes you'll pick them and you just drop them on the floor. You don't want to keep those. They will make the entire pint that we're packing them in mold 
if there's one split tomato in that pint. It'll make the whole batch go bad. So I'm sure it's a nutritional and environmental issue that could be corrected, but since these are getting fed exactly what the other greenhouses are getting fed, I don't really have a good way to adjust that accordingly. So it is what it is. It works for us. By the end of July, we don't really need these anymore anyway because every farmer's market stand at the farmer's markets will be selling some sort of tomatoes. So for us, we just need them in May and June and July, early July. That's when we uh, have the most demand for our tomatoes and can get a premium price for them. So these white tubes you see us pulling off the T-post, they will go right there because these tomatoes will usually grow to the top of these things, about seven feet. Even though these are determinate tomatoes, and in the, in the field they would probably only grow about five or six feet tall, when they have the great growing environment of inside a greenhouse from all the extra heat and light, they grow beyond the height of these, oh, five foot nine or 10 T-post. So we put these extensions on them. When we're on our last stringing that will be held on the T-post, like right here, then we'll come and put this extension on here and that'll give us at least two or three more stringings up to here to hold the tomato plants up and keep them from flopping over and growing back down. All right, now we are sticking the drippers into the coconut core bags to get them rehydrated and fully saturated. The problem is some years you get them with a little divot in the middle and you can stick the steak right down in there, but this year they do not. It is a slab, it's almost like OSB. You cannot get it in there. So what we do is just poke it in the plastic and let it rest there. So now when I turn the water on, it's gonna drip out and go right into the bag. It doesn't necessarily have to go right in the middle, just anywhere in the bag, and they will fill up with water and rehydrate just fine. This is also a great opportunity for us to find drippers that may be bad and plugged. Because when I come out here tomorrow morning, most of them will be wet, the bags will be swelled up to about four inches high and ready for plants, but every now and then you'll find one dry. And that means the dripper's bad. So instead of checking all these drippers ahead of time, we just turn them on and then look for the bad ones or the dry ones tomorrow morning. We have the first four rows ready to rehydrate. Let's go turn on the water and see what happens. I forget from year to year how long it takes to rehydrate these. I think they'll be pretty full and ready to go by tomorrow. So here's a good example of one that's already rehydrating. There was a puddle of water right here from flushing out this hose and the bag has somehow soaked it up and it's already halfway rehydrated. It's about two inches tall. All right, let's go turn all these on and get some water flowing. I still can't believe I'm walking around in shorts and a t-shirt today. In early March, this is typically 50 degree weather during the day and it's been nearly 70 today and yesterday. Unbelievable. All right. We got water flowing in the grape greenhouse. Let's go check it out. Doing one more flush. You can see all the deposits, fertilizer deposits that came out of there. It was coming out almost brownish orange. That looks pretty good now. So now the header line is pressurized and the four individual lines are receiving the water. And I have these opened up back here as well flush them one more time before I shut the valve and pressurize those lines. Looks pretty good now. Look at all that junk that came out of there. Usually I have a catch container so I can look to see how much debris is still coming out. Well, we got a little leak here. Not sure what's going on there. Now all we have to do is wait. There's the dripper doing its job, sticking back in there. And all that water will gather onto the top of the coconut core and it'll swell right up here in a couple hours. 
I'm sure we'll have some dry ones that are plugged up. Another thing I gotta be careful of, um, the way I'm poking these through the bag, if they are angled down too much, the water will flow right down the stake and out the hole and gather on the ground cover instead of going in on top of the coconut core. So I'll walk up and down the rows, check all those to make sure the water is staying in the bags. All right, we are all finished up out here for today. I'll be back out here bright and early tomorrow morning for transplanting the grape tomatoes. So we'll see you then. Well, good morning. I am back for transplanting the grape tomatoes. They look great. Let's go down and take a look at the grape greenhouse and see how much water has been absorbed into those grow bags. I looked at them last night right before dark and they looked pretty good. I definitely found a few that were not um, getting water because of some plugged up drippers. And then I found a few that the water was running right out of the bag. So I made a few adjustments and hopefully we are good to go. So I did notice on these bags, they don't get as tall as bags I have used in the past. You can look at this one here. This one's a pretty good indicator of what they're all going to look like. Maybe three inches. I'm used to having bags that were four inches. And when I have gotten bags that were only like three inches high in the past, they were wider. So I'm a little concerned about the amount of coconut core in these bags. It doesn't look like uh, near as much as in the past uh, from different brand bags I've received. Now the place I get these in Ontario AMA Plastics, AMA Horticulture, that's what it's called. I don't really have a choice. I mean, I guess I could choose the same ones I got last year, but they didn't have the pre-cut holes. So hopefully these will work out all right. Nothing I can do about it now, right? We're gonna use them. So let's go get tomato plants loaded up, get them down here and get these things transplanted. Whoo, it is a bit brisk today. We've got a 15 to 20 mile an hour wind and it's probably in the 40s. Typical March weather here in Ohio. We are using a box truck to transfer the plants down to the grape house today. Um, it's, it's a little further distance and I think we can just load them all up in one load, maybe two loads, move them all at once instead of using the blue wagons. This wind is not gonna be good on the tomatoes if we use the wagons. So we're gonna use the box truck method today. I think we'll open up the lift gate here, make it a little easier to get in and out of this truck. By the way, what do you guys think about the sound quality using the lav mic? I've had a little trouble with it from time to time and I didn't use it in the last couple videos, but uh, when it does work, I think it sounds great. Um, let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Continue using the lav mic so I can talk from a distance away from the camera and hopefully picking up my audio good. Uh, I just feel like when I don't have the lav mic and I'm in the greenhouses with fans running and I'm turning the camera around continually, talking to it or showing you what I'm looking at, the, the sound varies so much. Even when you turn your face away from the camera, you know, the sound varies and it's more adjustments in the editing process um, when I'm putting the video together. So hopefully this is working good today. And if it is, I will continue using it. Hopefully you guys like it as well. All right, let's get these plants loaded up. All right. These puppies are getting big. Wow. These plants are getting so big, you pretty much just got to carry them one at a time. They look really nice. This might be the tallest I've ever allowed my grapes to get before transplanting. I mean, look at those right there. That one's six inches above the bamboo stake. I'm gonna have to move the clips up on some of these, but I'll be stringing these up pretty quickly after transplanting, probably here in the next couple days or the first of next week. They're so tall that they're like falling over into the other plants. And the last thing we want is them to get all tangled up or to break them. So maybe we'll just put like three rows in here. You've heard me talk about the importance of air pruning in the past. This is not air pruned. Look at that. 
That is terrible. What happened is the roots grew down inside of the flat that I had underneath them. I had the flat turned the wrong direction. So the roots grew down into the little insert, the little cells. See how those roots are like grown into a little circular pattern? Wow. I do not like to see that. I mean, they have great healthy roots, but that is not what we want. Those are supposed to be air pruned up into the, up into the block, Rockwell Cube. Now we gotta be careful sliding these things in so we don't damage all the roots. All right, we'll get all these plants moved into the greenhouse where it's nice and toasty. trying to be careful with these because of all the well see that one's not too bad the roots on this one you know kind of look more like what we're, we expect so maybe I had the tray that it was on top of turned the other way around which is the way they were supposed to be kind of upside down we'll get all these plants spaced out in here get them out of the cold wind and then we'll get transplanting All right, so in these coconut core bags, they're getting pretty well saturated. So we're just pulling the drippers out right now because I want to make sure they're working before I put them into the plants. So we're pulling those out and I just rough up the coconut core just a bit to make sure we have good contact with the base of the Rockwell cube and those roots that are all kind of hanging down. And that's all there is to it. So got me a plant that's not air pruned very well but you can see how healthy the, that root system is unbelievable it's kind of a hard uneven slab so I'll just rough it up a little bit make sure it's uh, nice and level and then try to get as many of those roots within the bag as I can and then I'll give the stake just a little push the stakes don't want to go down inside that coconut core very easy especially the fatter stakes so if it's leaning, what I'm gonna do is pull the stake out and just resituate it so it's more straight up and down to make sure that plant doesn't fall over on us. Now you can see this one looks a little dry. But now that I'm feeling it, it's pretty moist. Just a different consistency of core. Like you can see this one looks really hairy, kind of like the outside of a coconut, shredded coconut. And sometimes it'll look like tree bark. So it's, it's a little inconsistent, but it's a great substrate to grow in. Something I failed to mention yesterday, there is one downside to using a coconut core versus perlite. Um, the perlite is sterile and inert. There is nothing in it. But the coconut core could possibly have stuff in it. I don't know what stuff. There could be maybe some salts in it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have heard that it often does not have a neutral pH and there could be lingering residues of some sort within the uh, coconut core. But once these things have been watered and there's leachate coming out of the bag, see what I'm going to do now after these are planted is I'll put a slit. Oh, they're watering right now. So that's what we'll do. We'll stick the stake right in like that. These bags will get flooded and you'll start seeing them bulge out the bottom and I'll put a little slit in them. Well, about halfway up, so there's still like a reservoir at the bottom of the bag with water in it. Um, and then I can check that water. I can pull out that where it's slit, pull open the bag and dip my pH meter in there, check the pH and the electrical conductivity to see what the leachate is. But uh, yeah, even though it's not a sterile inert substrate that we're growing in, it still is a great product to use for these grape tomatoes, in my opinion. Here in a couple days, I'll have to run a string trellis through here to hold these plants up because they'll start getting top heavy and they'll start flopping over on me. And I don't want that. Um, normally, I let them root in 
for about a week before I run the string because it'll pull on these bamboo stakes and sometimes uproot the plant before it has had a chance to like anchor itself in to the, to the uh, coconut core because the strings kind of zigzag between the T-posts. And I'll show you all that when we string them up and it's called the Florida Weave System. And I do have a video about this already and a short about it. I will link those in the description box below. If you don't want to wait to see it happen next week, you can watch it right now. But uh, we'll do the first stringing, oh, probably about two thirds up the plant, and then about every eight to 12 inches, all the way up until the plants are fully mature and not growing any, any longer or any taller. I think I probably do seven or eight strings using the Florida weave method in here. And it does a great job of keeping all the plants upright and in place. It keeps all the grape tomatoes that are actually the actual harvestable grape tomatoes, keeps them from flopping down and laying, laying on the floor. All of our harvestable crop will be pretty much knee high and above. You know, and as the plant continues to mature and be harvested, the grape tomatoes will be higher and higher up on the plant. So yeah, the Florida weave system is a great method for a great cheap method for stringing up tomatoes in a greenhouse if you don't want to put an overhead trellis system above a crop. As expensive as it is to grow greenhouse tomatoes with the extra heating costs and manpower and just everything, you know, vine clips, uh, J hooks, it's just a lot of extra expense. Fertilizer and acid and the tomato hooks, of course. Um, you know, we get two seasons out of our tomato hooks and we don't rewind them back up. It's I've tried it one year. It is a big pain in the butt. It's uh, for me, it works out better just to buy a new tomato hook every year. But a lot of people only get one year out of their tomato hooks, especially if they're growing 10 months of the year, 10 or 11 months, you know, to maximize that greenhouse space. But we have a pretty short growing season. We only need ours, our harvestable tomatoes from uh, May through September, and mainly August, really. Once we get to August, mid-August, I'd say, our field tomatoes are really kicking in pretty good and we don't have much, much demand or need for the greenhouse tomatoes any longer after that. And that's why we terminate them in September. Get them all ripped out, get the greenhouses cleaned up while I still have labor on hand before they all go back to school for the year. You know, every year is a little different. This year they took off really well because we had a pretty mild winter and a little more sun than we normally have. So I'm kind of surprised they're so leggy. You know, I would prefer these plants to be about a foot, foot and a half, not two and a half feet. Just makes them a lot more difficult to work with and more fragile and you just gotta be more careful handling them. And these darn roots, I've never seen anything like this. Definitely a strange year, but they still look pretty good. I don't think we're gonna have any major issues. Look at that. There's six inch roots coming out the bottom of that one. Holy moly. And I want to get as many of them as I can into that core. I guess if you don't get them all in there, it's not that big of a deal. They'll still shoot down plenty of roots. And the ones hanging on the outside will probably just die, but there's a ample root structure there that I don't think it's a problem. It's getting harder and harder for me to enjoy working on my hands and knees <laughs> the older I get. But it's just one of those things you gotta do. I mean, I could be in here sitting on one of my carts. I have garden carts that have four wheels and a seat. But you're still bending over quite a bit. I uh, prefer just to be on my hands and knees and it's only for you know, an, an hour and then we'll have it done. But it's probably gonna get harder and harder for me to be comfortable working on my knees the older I get. I've been growing in this greenhouse since 2018. In this exact spot, I had a half acre high tunnel. A high tunnel is different from a greenhouse in that it only has one layer of poly. And this high tunnel actually was held on by rope structure, it zigzagged over the top of the poly. We, we, we would remove that rope, let the poly fall down and roll it up in protective plastic and actually store it right in the high, on top of the high tunnel down in the, at the base of it 
during the winter and put the plastic back, back on in the spring. And it was a nightmare um, using that high tunnel from 2009 is when I bought it to 2017 is when I sold it. I sold it to a, another grower in Pennsylvania that was expanding their uh, grafting business. And I wanted to go back to more of a simple greenhouse. A greenhouse has two layers of poly with air inflated inside. There's usually water, electricity, lights, automated louvers and exhaust fans. That, that's what makes a greenhouse different than a high tunnel. A high tunnel is just the most simple, cheapest way to protect your crop. It has a single layer of plastic and usually no water or power or automation. Transplant is going pretty good. We got two rows done, working on the next two rows. And I wanted to show you our uh, heat distribution system in this greenhouse is a little different than the other ones. I just have the heater blowing directly into the back of the fan jet and the convection tube will carry the air down to the end of the greenhouse and the holes are spaced at about four o'clock and eight o'clock. And I'll turn it on for you so you can see what this looks like. And I see I, we got a pretty good hole here I got to tape up. Time for a new tube. So you can see how the holes are kind of coming down at about four o'clock and eight o'clock on the other side. Does a really good job of mixing the heat with the cool air in the greenhouse and blowing it down into the foliage. If we didn't have the convection tube and the fan jet distributing the air, we'd have to have horizontal airflow fans blowing it down one side and then maybe two or three blowing it down the other side to kind of circulate the air in here. I like this method much better. It works really good. All right, four rows completed, two rows yet to plant. We haven't even seeded those final two rows yet. Um, I think I'll be doing it later on this week or the first of next week. So probably six to eight weeks before we plant those final two rows. And that'll stage our harvest in here just a little bit. Otherwise, we would get too many grape tomatoes coming on at once and would have trouble selling all of them. So this method works out really good for us. Well, another day of farming in the books. This is where we're going to end today's video. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you again real soon down on the farm.